Turn, please, to page two and three. We're down at the bottom, the last two lines. The last four lines, if you count the whole stanza. Let's put a chant to it, musical tones instead of just spoken. And I'll give you, we, we honor the Chinese original just by reciting it and then we're in the process of translating. So uh, let's read it in Mandarin first. It's the same as the invocation we just did. There's Chinese characters, if you're happy with those. And uh, if those are fresh for you, then look at the uh, Romanized sounds below them. And we'll, I'll give you a line and you give it back. Su zai tian wang bing zhen shu. Si zai tian wang bing zhen shu, xin shang huan xi zhu kong zhong. Huan xi zhu kong zhong, san bao cheng yun shi gong yang. Zan yan fu zi kuai shen shu. All right, over to the right. Let's do it in unison together with me. The Deva King of Sovereignty and his following felt great happiness and resting in the air tossed gemstones and created clouds which they held up by way of making offerings. They said, O oh, disciple of the Buddha, please teach us now. All right, what's going on? This is uh, chapter number 26, and it's part number six of chapter 26. There are 10 parts. And each of these uh, parts can stand by itself. Together, they make this chapter called the 10 grounds, the 10 stages. And it's talking about bodhisattvas. What's a bodhisattva? How do they think? How do they behave? What do they look like? What do they do? That's what this chapter is about and it goes in great detail it's really satisfying because it takes you into the mind of the bodhisattva and it says and the bodhisattva thought this and upon seeing this the bodhisattva reacted in this way this is what he thought and then it describes what he does and the bodhisattva that is being described is a, just a generic uh, kind of a classical description of a bodhisattva there's no specific Gender, age, racial, background, socioeconomic status is just the bodhisattva. So as a result, we can easily put ourselves into that and try it on. What if I did that? Could I ever do that? That's a pretty high bar to set of goodness, of altruism, of decency, of unselfishness. And yet, if you know, if we're never going to quite match the standards of the Avatamsaka Bodhisattva, at least it gives you that sense of this exists. This is this paradigm has been in the world for more than two thousand years, and it's fresh. It's timeless, ageless. Not only old, it's ageless. But somehow, in a way, it. When I go over these, I recognize it. It's like, oh yeah. I have an echo of that somewhere far away and I would aspire to that. Maybe I'll move in that direction. Kind of like a compass bearing. So we're right at the start of number six. And what has happened? I didn't give you the uh, background two weeks ago, two lectures ago when we first started. I have a uh, uh, table of all the chapters of the Avatamsaka and what gets introduced what gets uh, what is what are the recurring patterns in each of the various chapters and what's going on in uh, in this particular chapter in this ground and it's pretty astounding uh, I'll I'll let 
whether you're astounded or not is up to you. I find it very astounding, kind of compelling to look at this. And we're here in the Ten Grounds. And of the uh, seven places and nine assemblies, this is number six. So we're more than halfway through our sutra. In other words, this sutra was not explained by the Buddha all at once. He went from place to place because it's quite long. And maybe night fell. Maybe uh, people got tired. Maybe uh, the Buddha, it was time for lunch, and so he stopped. Maybe they were definitely the, the assemblies are a different length. So the Buddha would lecture here, move on, another place. And so this is number six, and it was explained in the heavens. And right away, if you were raised in a Judeo-Christian biblical context, heavens, plural, is kind of a new idea, more than one. And Buddhism and Hinduism, interestingly enough, shares this vision of multiple heavens. So that's not too surprising since the Buddha was raised in a Brahmanical society, although his caste was not Brahman. But these ideas were definitely floating there. Um, there's quite a few notions in the Buddha's teaching that are shared with, with Hinduism. Cause and effect, for one. The idea of rebirth for another. Um, but he was a significant reformer in the midst of that. And we're not going to go there tonight because that would be like history of Buddhism. And we want to bring this forward to 2014. So this is number six. In the heavens. We're in the heavens. Get used to it. Fasten your seatbelt. Right? What's it look like out the window? Oh, here comes the service to air missile. Whew, I'm glad I missed it. Whew, boy, oh boy. Not funny. Hmm. So it's the, the, uh, of the heavens of the desire realm, this is number uh, five. It's not the top. There's another, uh, there's another lecture that happens uh, it, at the top of the desire realm, which is interesting because it's Mara's heaven. Mara being the Christian equivalent, the Jewish equivalent would be Satan, lives in the heavens. Ooh. Go away, I thought the devil was in the hell, right? Wasn't the devil in hell? And yes, he was, but he fell there, right? Anybody familiar with the book of Job? The book of Job, Satan's up in heaven talking to God, making a deal how to devil his best disciple. So interesting parallels. If, if you go poking around into comparative religion, you find these uh, crossovers. So... Like I say, we're not going there tonight, but this was number six. It happened six out of uh, nine. It happened in the heaven called Hualu Tin, the, the heaven of transformed desires, where desire gets taken from one being to another, ripped off, one might say. So... That's an interesting story all by itself. The Buddha, as he spoke the sutra, sent light out from his body, it says. Now, can you imagine? How do we do that? Well, we do it with cosmetics, right? We do it with contact lenses. We send light out from our Hermes handbag. We send light out from our BMWs, right? External stuff, stuff we buy, stuff that is shiny and flashy. The Buddha does it from his own body because of the, the internal transformations that happen as a function of his, of his samadhi when he meditates. So, where do the, and as the, the sutra goes through these various places, the lights come from different parts of the body. Now that is truly esoteric and weird, but that's what the sutra says. And you can imagine uh, how that might be. In this case, the light came from between the Buddha's eyebrows. How about that? And the speaker of this particular chapter is the Bodhisattva named Vajra Treasury, Treasury of Vajra. That's his name. And we've been listening to him throughout five of these stages. We're now at number six. So 
another one of the, the hallmarks of each of these uh, chapters is that the Buddha enters into a different samadhi each time he comes up with this teaching. So, bear with me. Hold on. What, is this, what could this possibly mean? If you think about, um, we're, I'm, I'm not touching number six yet. I'm going back to look at the ten grounds. This is all introductory stuff, and I, I didn't do it two lectures ago, so I want to do it now. Um, think about um, the Bible hmm? or the Torah, the first five books of Moses. They were revealed, they were uh, taught by a gift from God through the prophet down to humans. And the teachings were on those tablets. This was it. This is the word. And logos is really important to uh, the religions of the book, which is Judaism, Christianity, Islam. So it's unalterable. You don't change that. It's God's word. Praise be to God. And so that's how most religions come. They are revealed from an external source. What is it about the Buddha Dharma that is compelling and different? There was no revelation. They were not handed down. If anything, they were... Uh, I don't want to say coughed up. Coughed up sounds very inelegant, doesn't it? They were um, uncovered from within. How? Through a process of samadhi. Through stilling, calming, purifying the mind. What was the Buddha doing under the Bodhi tree uh, for those last 49 days before he woke up, he was calming his mind. They, they call it samadhi, this process of stillness and concentration. And you know, um, sometimes of the day, sometimes of the week, you're calmer than other days. Right? If you have a meditation practice, you can touch right there. After you sit, you're feeling more together. You're feeling more composed. You see deeper. Right? Problems that when we're moving around, active in the day, engaging our senses, seem so complicated, so many levels, so twisted, difficult. When you sit still for a while, there's this sense of, aha, oh, hmm, that was it. It was there all along. I was just too turbid. I was just too uh, moving too much to see the connection. But after sitting still, then it's like, oh yeah. Oh, that was there waiting for me to see it. It was there all along. Did the, did the understanding arrive from anywhere else? No. It was revealed to you internally by that process of stilling. Um, if you go look at the water flowing in the gutter after a rainstorm where it's rolling down, you've got leaves, twigs, dirt, cigarette butts. You don't see what's, you don't see the gutter itself because the water is rushing past. Um, another available example is if you cross the Richmond Bridge or the uh, San Mateo Bridge uh, during a windy uh, during a windy day, windy night, you don't see the nature of the bay because it's choppy, it's moving. If you go uh, four in the morning after a calm night, you can actually see through the, the surface of the water down a certain depth because the water's calm. Samadhi is that process of calming the water. The Buddha entered Samadhi, up came this information. It was available to him. It didn't come from anywhere, but now his mind was quiet enough. He could see through. So I think that's the process. And when I say he entered the 
Pusa Jihui Guang Ming San Mei, the Bodhisattva's wisdom light, light of the Bodhisattva's wisdom samadhi, the Dharma of the Ten Grounds was accessed that way. All right? Um, you could probably find an analogy to searching on your computer. Um, astronomers get a bigger telescope and they can see further out into the universe. It's not that they created it, it was there all along, but with the added magnification, the stars appear, right? Hubble sees through these tiny little windows into infinite galaxies that before was just a pinpoint. Now they can focus on it and this another infinity opens up. So the Buddha enters Samadhi and up comes the Sutra Dharma from inside. Different, different from all religions that come bequeathed through revelation. And now, one more step into that information, which is so interesting. Because sutras come from a different source than revelation, which you don't go around changing the word of God, right? The book of Genesis is the book of Genesis. Sutras, the canon, the Buddhist canon, that wall of books is still open, right? Anybody tonight who like enters Samadhi and wakes up can deliver a text that is identical in wisdom to the Buddhas because the process is the same and each one of us has the, all the requirements to have wisdom appear. So the Buddhist canon is still open. It's not a closed, you know, and it's not a closed body of sacred literature. Interesting comparison point of view. Okay. So he entered that Bodhisattva's wisdom like Samadhi and he spoke the Dharma of the Ten Grounds and it's uh, six scrolls in, in Chinese. So that's kind of the basic information for our, our text. Can we go back to page two and three? And we're down at the bottom. We just said, Zizai Tian Wang, Bing Jian Shu, Xin Sheng Huan Xi, Zhu Kong Zhong. The Deva king of sovereignty and his following felt great happiness and resting in the air. What happened? San Bao Cheng Yun Chi Gong Yang. San Yan Fu Zi Kuai Xuan Shuo. They tossed gemstones and created clouds, which they held up by way of making offerings. If you can imagine this for a movie, the cameras are taking us to the heavens where the Buddha is sitting in full lotus, surrounded by all the beings who have come to hear him speak the Dharma. And the actors in the first scene of the sixth ground are the devas themselves. The gods are there, very happy that the Buddha is in their neighborhood to teach this next piece of the chapter. And so how do devas respond? They make offerings. And they make incredible offerings. Last week we heard about jewels, flowers, garlands, necklaces, banners, streamers, canopies, balms, incense that is. All his offerings. So devas are good at bringing out these uh, valuable Offerings, these things as offerings. And we, we talked about them last week. How this particular Dharma is not one... I remember in the Bible, as I, I grew up Methodist, and one of the offerings that I recall as a kid being particularly repelled by was a burnt lamb. Right? The, the shepherds slaughtered a, a lamb uh, charcoal broiled it and put it on the altar or put it on the in the temple and okay so that's what they had that was valuable offering because if they're if it's an agrarian uh not an agrarian sorry it's a um what's the word they're shepherds and they're pastoral pastoral they don't pull the crops out of the ground they tend the flocks of oxen and sheep and goats and the things that can flourish in a very dry climate. So if that's your wealth, that's what you offer. But one of the, again, uh, 
comparisons are odious. We're not getting mileage out of being better or different than uh, biblical cultures. And, but just it's interesting to it helps us understand what's happening here by comparing it to something that's closer to us. So if you um, had the context of the Bible as kind of your sacred literature growing up, nothing in the sutras died before it was made an offering. There was no killing involved, which is all right, that's good. Um, What do we have? We have flowers, garlands, not so much garlands, but you could make garlands out of of, uh, carnations. Necklaces, yep. Banners, streamers, we don't have any. I guess those are uh, inscriptions, they're not exactly banners. Up at the city of 10,000 Buddhas up in Ukiah, there are actual banners and streamers hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it's a traditional offering. Canopies, think umbrella. Fragrant balms, incense. We've got three kinds of incense on the altar. So these are all things from nature or things that anybody can offer because you sew together a banner. You string together flowers into a garland. And the devas do a really nice job of that. The gods do, apparently, according to the sutra. Now, um, most folks these days are drawn to Buddhism because of the word mindfulness. That's our new buzzword. And it's really hot. Mindfulness in education. Mindfulness in the workplace, right? Mindfulness on the basketball court. Mindful child rearing, right? Mindful golf. And um, why not? You know, Dharma is infiltrating Western culture. So interesting conversations where those things merge. And some people stop right there, and that's enough. That's, that's good to be able to pay attention to what you're doing with your body, your mouth, and your mind. To bring a sense of awareness and discipline, self-control to what before was instinct or uh, motivated strictly by uh, group standards, what your, what your buddies expected of you is what you did. So now I'm mindful, now I'm aware that every action bears a a result, so I want to do it wisely, I want to choose. Good. If you take the next step and say, well, what else is there beside mindfulness? Beyond meditation, what? Like, when I stand up from meditation, what next? If you ask that question, one of the places to go among the various places is to the Buddhist sutras. So that's kind of the context of what we're doing tonight. We take 90 minutes out of our Saturday night to listen to the Buddha's voice in these texts. And of course that requires you to translate it, which is we're in this process of translating as we go. So, all right, when you touch the Buddha's sutras, what do you find? This one in particular has to do with the practice of the Bodhisattva. And one of the things that Bodhisattvas do is give a lot. There's lots and lots of, the classical word is offerings, which an offering is kind of up. I'd like to offer this up. Why? It's a nice thing. It's a bowl of steaming rice. Hmm, Good. It's beautiful orchids. I'd like to offer service. I'm a karma yogi. I would like to, you know, water the Oh, water, California, drought, no. I would like to um, replace the lawn with native plants. Less water. Mm, Good. Thoughtful. Mindful. Uh, I would like to offer incense. I would like to offer sweeping the walk. You know, different kinds of offerings. This is something that bodhisattvas do. And why? Why is that big? Um... It's a way of giving the self away, reducing attachment to stuff, to personal benefit. It's what happens to the giver that matters. And that's a very different way of looking at it. It's not so much that the Buddha 
wants this stuff. Give me all the incense you got. I want good incense, right? None of your dime store incense. I want the real stuff. Speaking of the real stuff, America has all, North American continent has all the, uh, the materials for pioneering some new wonderful incenses. Not sandalwood, we don't have sandalwood, but we've got pine, pinon, we've got cedar, we've got um, redwood incense? No, I don't think so. Uh, and stay away from eucalyptus. Eucalyptus incense gets in your lungs, not a good thing. But we have some very aromatic fragrant woods, which could be super good incense. So apply yourself with diligence, entrepreneurs. There are lots of mindfulness markets available out there. <laughs> we'll make a killing in Buddhist incense. No. You know, adapt. So, you can make an offering of incense. And the Bodhisattva does. And every time you give, you give away. The act of giving reduces the sense of me and mine and all the good stuff for me. Which from the Buddhist point of view is a good thing to do, to reduce this sense of me in the middle or worse, me only. Right? All of you are outside of me and I expect to get the best stuff. I deserve a break today. I'm loving it. You know, and our marketplace culture puts us in the middle and I got to get the best for me. That's how it's read to us by the marketplace. So the Buddha Dharma says, mm, the self is the biggest problem. It's an impediment. It's a real self. It's a real illusion. It's a genuine illusory self. I work on that sense of self. And you need it to get through the world, certainly. And we don't, we're studying the bodhisattva. We aren't bodhisattvas yet. So it's really helpful to not take that self as real. It's an illusion. And if we see it that way, we, we can function to reduce the attachment, reduce that illusory sense of self, see through the veil. Cut through the illusion. Wake up to the illusion is what the Buddha did. Giving away that self is a really good way to do it. So they talk about giving as the first practice done by all Buddhas. So Buddhas is, to become a Buddha is the end of the road. The start of the road is to give more, to share, to give away, to give up, to renounce, to surrender. All these words that we have that have to do with giving. To charity, charity has a sense of, here, you need it, I don't want it anymore. You know, they did charity, kind of, to the poor, sad recipients. That's an obstacle. There's all huge kinds of self in that. So charity is not the word. Generosity is a really good word. And a generosity of spirit. That we see the connection, and we want to let the stuff flow through. It's not mine to begin with, nor is this. You know, we get confused about that. This is me, and everything is mine. Right? So, British Petroleum loses control of their drilling tower down in the Gulf, and all that oil spills out into the clear, sparkling waters that teem with life, and destroy that economy for humans, but for the turtles, for the cormorants, right, for the fish. And people say, okay, BP, pay for the spill. BP says, well, not really our oil. We were only digging it up, you know. So who in the end, who owns that oil, right? So you, that's, that's a door. That's a way to start looking at it. We're all borrowing it, every bit of it. So if we can see it that way and move the stuff through, use what we need and leave the rest. Most of all, don't accumulate so much. You know, we were talking today at lunch how um, 
California, 94% of the water in California goes to agriculture. 6% of the water used in California goes to people. The potable water, the drinkable water, right? 6%. And they say if you, in order to, uh, okay, I'm ahead of myself. The um, number one consumer of that 94% of the water is livestock industry, either directly by giving the cows water to drink or washing their uh, excrement down the drain and keeping it clean, but more importantly, by putting it on crops that are specifically heading for the cows and the pigs and the sheep and the geese, right? How much water creates a pound of wheat? 160 gallons to produce a pound of wheat. How much water to produce a pound of beef? 1,600 gallons, measurable, quantifiable, right? Two zeros at the end of that one. So 20 200 times more to produce beef, which a pound of beef feeds how many people? Mm, you know, make it into ground beef, the hamburgers go to a few folks. But if you take a pound of wheat, you can feed lots and lots of folks with the bread and the pasta and the donuts mm, and the baked goods with that wheat. So why not feed the people directly with the grains, save all that water, and save the cows? Right? Mm, I know the answer to that question, why not? It's because the meat and dairy industry have a chokehold on legislation, and we are habituated. We like the flavor. Okay, so that's the way we've done it. But that wasn't true before World War II, interestingly enough. If you go back and poke around, John Robbins does a really good job. M mind you, I am far away from my sutra text. I think I'm preaching. Stop preaching. Okay. One more story. John Robbins, Diet for New America, does, the son of Baskin Robbins, who did not take his father's millions, says uh, he has tracked the... Uh, the American diet before World War II, which was the main catalyst for what? For nitrate fertilizer. Chemical fertilizer came about when American universities uh, were pushed to increase the yield per acre to feed the soldiers, to feed our men in uniform and women. So the same acre of ground now produced, you know, 1,300 bushels of corn, whereas before it was 300 bushels of corn, because of nitrate fertilizers, chemical fertilizer. Before, it was not as intensely farmed. War is over. You don't stop producing all this valuable agriculture. What do you do? You find a way. Who eats corn? Well, cows could eat corn. So suddenly, people before the war pretty much ate meat on Saturday night. We didn't eat meat three meals a day every day of the week. But that is the way we do it now because suddenly we have all this extra grain. Cows don't eat grain, cows eat grass. But if you have all these soybeans, all this corn, all this wheat, feed it to the animals and suddenly every acre is going to livestock. And McDonald's gets going, and now we're cutting rainforest to the tune of, what's the statistic? Something like three football fields a minute of the rainforest is being devoured to plant crops which go to cows which come back to America in the form of McDonald's. So anyway, never mind, I'm not preaching. You didn't hear it here. We do Buddhism here. What does that have to do with Buddhism? So offerings, right? Well, we could make an offering of 
paying attention to water usage and thinking, hmm, if I were to eat lower on the food chain, on the food pyramid, if I were to eat more vegetables and less beef, would I be moving, whether I directly do it, would I be moving towards less water-intensive diet, thereby helping relieve the drought? Oh yes, directly. Make your preferences known. In California, we don't need to eat meat as Buddhists, right? We can do very well with the vegetables here in the world's salad bowl, California. So it's interesting that uh, the choices I make at my dinner table directly affect the climate and the results of the climate, which is now currently is going to be water rations. We, uh, went in, we instituted paper plates today for our Saturday lunch uh, to reduce the amount of dishwasher that we use to wash. But my goodness, that's a drop in the bucket, pun intended, compared to if we could just take some of those cows out of the food chain and let them graze on the grass that they were made to graze. All right, enough already. Here are the devas. San Bao, Cheng Yun, Shi Gongyang. Our camera is moving in on these gods flying around, looking probably like this one or that one over there on the two ends. And what are they doing? They're, in this case, they're taking these jewels and going very dramatically like that. And they make kind of firework sparkly clouds. And then they take the clouds and they offer them to the Buddha. I imagine that's how the sutra is giving it to us, right? So this is the prelude to the Dharma being spoken. They're saying, Buddha, man, you are here to speak the Dharma. We're so happy here. May I offer up this cloud of jewels? You know, and the Buddha's going, no problem. Right? As you please. Zanyan, Fords of the Kwaishan Shuo, and they say, O oh, disciple of the Buddha, please teach us now. Who are they saying this to? Not the Buddha. They're saying it to the Bodhisattva that the Buddha tapped to speak this Dharma. His name is treasury of Vajra, Vajra treasury bodhisattva. This is really interesting to um, people who are used to Buddha sutras to discover that most of the Avatamsaka Sutra is not spoken by the Buddha. Most of it is spoken by bodhisattvas, even a deva, a god speaks part of it, who the Buddha kind of... uh, what do you say, deputizes to speak the Dharma. He gives them that samadhi, that insight, and from their natures comes the Sutra Dharma. Turn the page, please, four and five. Any questions? Yeah, Connie. Does he fly to the heavens? In heaven to start with. Okay, so how does Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva get to the heavens? How does the Buddha get to the heavens, right? Um, I have to say, honestly, uh, I don't know specifically. The sutra gives us clues, which is um, at a certain point, these are Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, that is to say they're, they're advanced, they're the senior accomplished Bodhisattvas among Bodhisattvas. At a certain point in your meditation, um, apparently, you're able to travel. What travels? Mysterious. I, I can't say I know specifically, but they say that um, the Buddha has three bodies, is the way the Dharma goes. There's the Dharma body, which is, they say, just like space. And maybe one way to think, I'm, I'm answering your question, so this is kind of the, ra- the complete answer. When your ego is gone, when you no longer think that you stop with your skin and you're only this much, it's not the case that nothing is there, it's the case that everything is there. You're connected. You see the relationship, the connection between the earth, air, fire, and water in your body and all the elemental earth, air, fire, and water around. You see the connection between your Buddha nature and 
everyone else's Buddha nature, past, present, and future. And they say that's a state of tzudzai, that's a state of ishvara, a state of true ease and comfort, self-mastery. So that's the Dharma body. They say it's like empty space. There's a second body called the reward body. And the reward body is the one you see. That's our Buddha standing here. And these are bodhisattvas here. In our, but the, the one who looks like a monk uh, sitting under the tree, the one wearing a robe. He's got long ear lobes. He's handsome. Uh, skin is like you know, porcelain and ivory and gold. That is called the reward body. There's a third body that Buddhas and Bodhisattvas bring forth. And they say it's just, it's how it is. You know, for me to be telling you about this, don't assume that I've seen this with my own eyes. I'm reflecting what the Dharma says. This is a, the end of the line. This is graduation after the process of cultivation. That third body is called the transformation body. And it's also called the re response body sometimes. That transformation body is able to travel. Okay? They say it's like it, it can take on different shapes, different forms, and it can move. So you see the Buddha sitting under the tree, but in fact his Hua Shen, also called Ying Shen, is going out to the Buddha's Dharma assemblies. And it's able to do things there. It functions. It goes out and it makes offerings. It listens to the Dharma. It applauds. It's happy when the Buddha speaks the Dharma. So that's the answer, Connie. It's, it's not this body that goes. You know, it's, it's that third body called the transformation body that travels. That's, that's what it says. Okay, moving forward, page four and five. We're on the top here. Limitless numbers of Deva maidens hovered in the air and with musical notes in unison sang praises of the Buddha. All their songs sang words such as these, the Buddha's teachings chase away the illness of affliction the illnesses of afflictions. How about that? That's, uh, as I say, if, if this were a movie, this is the prelude. The, the, the Dharma is not, the Dharma assembly has begun, but the Bodhisattva slash the Buddha hasn't started speaking yet. He's still in Samadhi waiting for the, the preliminaries to come to an end. Just a moment before, Marek, took incense, walked around, went back, knelt down and said, will the Sangha with great virtue out of compassion? So that was a request for Dharma. We, I went, Namo Tassa Bhagavato, right? Which is praise of the Buddha, and you gave it back to me. Um, that's what's going on here. Those are preliminaries before the Dharma lecture begins. And here the Sutra gives us this very movie-like, very cinematic Description of activity before the Buddha speaks, before the Bodhisattva speaks. It's kind of neat. I mean, it's, this is, you could say, timeless pageantry, timeless ritual. Um, the devas are happy because they're going to hear, they expect, they expect they're going to hear teachings which will end suffering. They're going to hear, if you had to say it in a word, truth. Dharma truth about the way things are, how things really are. Um, Ajahn Sumedho was at CTTB last Sunday, and he's uh, been, he's 49 years in robes, right? He's the senior Western monastic. I don't, anybody know how long Bhikkhu Bodhi has been a Bhikkhu? I think Sumedho's older, I think. Bhikkhu Bodhi is. 46 years or something like that. Okay. 75. 67 was Bhikkhu Bodhi. And Sumedho was 64. Okay, there you go. I was 76. 
So, uh, Sumedho is so good at this particular dharma. And they, this is such a hallmark, uh, signature phrase of his Theravada teaching, the way things are. He, the, he, that's how he translates the, dar, dar, the word dharma, the way things are. And I, I can't do it. He has this great deep voice, you know, he's a big lion, Leo. The way things are. <laughs> he shows his lion teeth. <laughs> and he's great. What a father figure. He is so paternal. Lung poor, you know, the holy father. So, Yeah, he's great. So the way things are. And the way things are means you don't have to think about it. You don't need to talk about it. It's how things are before words and thoughts. And that's been one of my definitions of the Tao, which I haven't heard Ajahn Sumedho talk about the Tao because it's particularly a, a Chinese rendering. But, you know, where does the, the tight circle of the Tao start and the tight circle of the Dharma end? They don't. They overlap. It's pretty much the same idea, which is our consciousness slices up things the way they are, gives it names, discriminates, categorizes, buys and sells, puts into a database, right? And tries to cram as much of that information into a very contained space, which is the conscious mind. So name and form arises there. And as soon as we stop that, then the way things are suddenly goes, whoo, fills the universe. So, one of the way things are is that when the Buddha is coming to talk about this, the devas go, yippee, we're going to hear the Dharma, right? Whew, have some jewels, have a cloud. There it is. And the next is songs. Music. We have these Devi choirs, right? Here are the Deva girls coming out and women singing, chanting, praising. How wonderful, right? Now, you'll all be glad to know that I have brought along a Deva instrument. <laughs> Says so right here. No, I'm kidding about that. This is a, it's, not only not a Deva instrument, it was made in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which is distinctly not a heavenly place. It's not too far below heaven, but it's not heaven either. It's, it's a very nice, Kalamazoo is a very nice place. It's where the Gibson musical manufacturers made this instrument in 1930. So this is an 80 year old instrument that makes heavenly sounds, Are you all transported to the heaven of Tahuads or that? No. Um, I'm only partly kidding because why? There's a story here. I want you to hear it the way. What about that tune?
Now, some people who are musically inclined will go, that's, that's, uh, that, um, that's, uh, that's the praise tune. That's the Guanyin Bodhisattva praise. That's the Amitabha praise. That's the Earth Store Bodhisattva praise. Na, na, mo guan shi yin pu sa. 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 Guan yin bodhisattva. 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 Guan yin pusa. Now, story goes that that melody is not an earthly melody. They say that once upon a time, um, a patriarch, a matriarch, a person whose eyes, spiritual vision was already functioning, went up to the heavens, to the Deva's realm, and brought that melody back and left it, and folks on earth went, yeah, 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 that's the one, that's the one. That, that we want that one, you know. Let's put those words there onto that melody. And so in Buddhist Asia, that melody has been the one. Stephen, is there anything musical about that? It's, it's pentatonic, right? resolves at the beginning of the next line yes um it's so well, it flows. so it goes in a circle yes. so it's it's designed to be repeated over and over again it's yes. actually very carefully crafted that way okay so stephen's point stephen is a composer musically wise um says that the the line da -di da di 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 da 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 di da di 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 da 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 di da da di is designed that there's tension at the end which brings you which resolves in the second go round at the beginning of each line so you have to sing it again there you go Da, 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 da. Right. So you hold on to that thought, Joyce. So you, it, it's a good chanting tune because it just flows one to the next, Joyce. An appoggiatura is is a is a type of non-harmonic tone. So it's not really a, an appoggiatura. It's it's just more of a natural uh, harmonic function. What would be like a dominant function to a tonic function. Okay. Yeah. It's a natural harmonic function. Yeah, now, the where the melodic line implies the harmony. All right. Now, I wanted to um, suggest that if you, why limitless numbers of deva maidens hovered in the air and with musical notes in unison sang praises of the Buddha or the Bodhisattvas. All their songs sang words such as these. The Buddha's teachings chase away the illness of afflictions. Buddha's teachings chase away the blues that we are heir to. Right? They chase away the blues. So, um, how interesting. If you look at where those notes vibrate in your body, just in terms of a simple up and down, if you do this idea of chakras, right, the wheels that yogis and mediums and body workers are, tell us are actually there, 
So you start, e. what's the highest, what's the lowest? E da di da, da da di da 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 da, di da 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 di da, da 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 di da da da, back up. So it's it goes to the top, down to the bottom, and it brings you back up. Very inspiring, uplifting, yeah. Versus na 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 you know, which is like makes you want to kill yourself, you know. <laughs> and versus this music that just brings you back to this sense of da di da, and then then there's the refrain. There's the short one. Di da 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 di dum di 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 da 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 di da. Da da di 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 da 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 dum dum, like that, and you feel exercised. You feel like your energy has flown and flowed and connected. It connects your inner circuitry with good energy when you chant that. As a result, you feel refreshed from the chanting. So, could this be? Yeah, I'm just throwing it out there. Could this be a deva chant that we're using all the time? Who, who was the music of the spheres? Borjak? Who came up with music of the spheres? Who say, there are a lot of composers who say that the closest, biggest things to us are oceans, but if you leave the planet, planets are the closest, biggest thing, the moon. And then, you know, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto. Pluto is a dwarf planet, to be correct. Poor Pluto gets kicked around a lot. So, so composers have said planets put out vibrations. If light and color are waves, maybe, if you measure them. So they have always been giving musical tones to the vibrations of these huge astral bodies out there. So could it be that as we chant these, we are aligning and attuning ourselves with these orbiting objects? Who knows? Yeah, maybe so. How interesting. So the devas use these tones to praise. They say, the Buddha's teachings, for yu nang chu fan nao bing. So, Buddha's words, able, get rid of, affliction, illness. All right? Words such as these. So, meaning those and others. That's, so we talked about the carrier of these words, the melody. And maybe we have an authentic deva melody. You know, is that the way the devas sing? Well, how do planets sound? Some composers say, this is how planets sound. They propose, this is Mars. Very martial. Here's Venus. Very harmonious. One wise person brought back this melody and said, this is what devas sing. Maybe so. So, that's the container. What do they say in those melodies? They say things such as, Buddha's words get rid of illness of affliction. Hmm. What is illness of affliction? That's Buddhist code talk. right? That's our lingo. That's our... Uh, shop talk. Illness of afflictions. Think of this, all right? I told the story of the first time I ever drove a Porsche. In college, a guy asked me to take his Porsche 911 from Rochester, Michigan to Toronto. And I had no idea. I drove a Volkswagen bus. 
1965 VW bus, you know. Third gear. And then if you were stop time. Try it again. You know, and away you go through four gears. Oh my. It was a wonderful bus. It was the Blue Max. And I cared for it dearly. So the guy says, you drive a VW? Yeah. Well, it's a lot like the Porsche. The Porsche is based on a VW engine. Shouldn't be any different. Okay, cool. You know, <laughs> give me the keys. Oh, man. First gear. <laughs> you know, gone. And the seat is pushing in my back, you know, as this car accelerates. And in, in second gear, I went off the road because it was hotter and faster than I was prepared for. And drove it to Toronto, and it's just like, oh, my eyes were bugging out because it, uh, the car functioned from steering to suspension to where you're lined up in the car, kind of lying down like this, you know, versus the bus where you're up like this. You know, the bus steering wheel is flat, you're like that. <laughs> And the engine goes like that. It's like a sewing machine. If anybody, is your mom, do you, anybody here have a, who has a sewing machine? Two, three, four, three, four, five, yeah. Sewing machines go right? You push that treadle and they go They don't have affliction. What's an affliction? Affliction is when your car is untuned and out, from the exhaust pipe comes this black smoke. That's the illness of affliction. The Porsche was, you know, just like that. And I, I was not prepared for a machine to be that fine, that finely honed and tuned and crafted to the point where the exhaust was tuned to a musical note, you know. And that was unafflicted. It was, and when your car is out of repair, that's the illness of afflictions. Okay, your very same body, today healthy and strong, tomorrow down with the flu, and you ache, and your temperature is wrong, you don't want to eat, and you're dripping and dripping, and, and you just want to stay still, and not, you can't get comfortable, you know. Six days later, you're fine again. Your body is essentially illness-free. So where'd it come from? It's just the illness of affliction, out of tune, untuned, right? When I hear fan nao bing, the illness of affliction, I think not tuned. You know, and I think of the most tuned up thing that I ever experienced maybe in terms of, of something created was that Porsche. So the Buddha's words Nang Chu can get rid of the illness of affliction. Why? Because the Buddha is a tuned human. Right? He's the Porsche among humans. There you go. Now there's an analogy you won't hear anywhere else. All right? Five forward gears. Overdrive. So um, when, when, you, when the illness of afflictions is gone, what's working for you? You have body, mind, and nature all in harmony. What's missing? Greed is missing. Anger is missing. Delusion is missing. Pride is missing. Doubts are missing. What's the flip side of pride? Low self-esteem. No, I just never, I'm, you know, I'm only a girl. I can't do science. Right? Um, I took my phone in to the Apple store yesterday because my phone battery was wonky, I thought. And uh, I made an appointment at the Genius Bar, which is what you have to do, and kept my appointment. I was there on time. And they found me a tech rep. What a great name. Hi, I'm your tech rep. 
and her name was Ashley. And Ashley was the tech rep. And where I grew up, like, tech reps weren't girls. And Ashley came out, and as soon as she came out, I relaxed. Because she was in charge of my phone. <laughs> she like, okay, would you please plug it in here to the head? And then she says, okay, tap this. I'm going to ask you to tap that. And she's going, spec, spec. no, your battery's fine, she says. But it's how you're using your phone that's the problem. You are the problem, not the phone. <laughs> I confess, I'm, you know, I am not worthy of Apple products. You know. So please accept my confession. So uh, she said, no, it's just, you know, we'll, uh, we'll reinstall. I'd prefer you install it off the cloud than off the I- iTunes. Uh, did you back it up? <clears throat> no. So, <laughs> so she embarrassed me. Ashley was like, had my number immediately. So what a tech rep. You know, girls don't do science. Uh, she did, you know, and she had my phone healthy in 20 minutes. So it's like, what's low self-esteem? It's a story. Low self-esteem is a story that someone told us that we bought. Right? Gender is not the issue in being a tech rep, clearly. I would have her fix my phone, you know, with confidence any day. So, where are those stories? Where do we hear we get that from? Affliction. And affliction can be habit. So, in other words, we've been doing it that way in our conscious mind for so long that that's the story we tell ourselves. Those stories arise from within. Or, maybe we got it from Dad, who was not happy having a smart daughter, maybe, or mom, who maybe didn't want competition. You know, that was kind of stuff, family dynamics, who knows. Maybe it was a misguided third grade teacher who steered all the girls towards home ec and away from the lab, you know. But it's a story. So arrogance is the same. Right? We have this phenomenon of the one-child policy in China. And all the Xiaohangdi, little emperors that are raised without siblings to socialize them. Right? Kids who, maybe it's not the parents, the parents are aware, the parents are very, very smart parents in China. But it's the grandparents who come down and they're so thrilled to have a son that they spoil the kid rotten. And he grows up thinking that he is the center of the universe. And he's, if he doesn't meet someone along the way who regularly lumps on him and shows him that there are bigger kids who are smarter than he is, he will grow up and run amok. There was a time in Australia, there were, I think things have mellowed out now, but when Chinese exchange students started to come to Australia and registering in large numbers, and of course the Australian provosts, and admission officers were thrilled to get those, you know, tuition dollars. They would take all these Chinese kids. And there were stories of the little emperors truly terrorizing campuses in Australia because nobody had ever told them no. And to the point where, well, the stories go on and on. But after a while, uh, nationwide, Australian University says, we would like a letter of guarantee that if your child uh, misbehaves here, 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 and here, he will be dismissed and sent home, his passport revoked, his student visa. So anyway, arrogance, a story we're told. Are you told by the authority figures in your life that you are perfect as you are? No matter how rotten you are, <laughs> you know, that it's you're just such kai, guai, guai, you know. Well, if you believe it and you don't have any siblings, I I was the middle kid. And my brother, I had a blessed with a wonderful brother. It was my sister. She would get me in trouble all the time. She would lay some trap or I would like throw a slipper at her. Mom, he did it again. You know, 
you know. <laughs> Little sister is giggling over here. I know, you have big brothers, right? So, right, we get socialized by siblings. That's the way it works. And if that's missing, it's really easy to believe the story, the first story we're told. So, here they are saying, the Buddha takes us way past self, others, rights, wrongs, yes, no, up, down, duality itself, and says, look at the mind, listen to your next thought. None of us are Buddhas to begin with. We all come with the Buddha nature, but with our habits, we diverge. Watch your next thought. If it's a weed, weed it, compost it. If it's a rose and you like roses, nurture it. It will produce beautiful fragrance and color and thorns and stalks and roots. That's the nature of roses, but you decide. Are you a gardener? Garden well. Garden wisely, because why? You're going to live in the garden you grow. So take charge of your garden. That's the teaching of cause and effect, right? From the Buddha. And that I liked, because I'm in charge of that. That's really up to me to take responsibility and learn to be a better gardener. Right? So the devas are getting ready to hear this and they're excited because uh, they count on hearing the truth from the Buddha about the way things, the way things are. Yep, Jerry. Okay. Is that a comment online? No, I said when you compost. Okay, what does it mean to compost a wheat? First of all, somebody might say, hey, wait a minute, you're talking about non duality. Why do you hate weeds? Aren't you supposed to, why, don't, don't, don't weeds need love too? Right? Well, yeah. What kind of garden do you want to grow? Grow the garden you want. But recognize that you're in charge of your garden. If you don't like it, change it. Okay, so that's the idea. Also implied in that notion that this is a weed, this is a rose, if you like roses. This is a weed, this is a green bean. Maybe you're growing crops. There is good and evil implicit in the Buddha's teaching. And on one hand, there is no good and evil from the Buddha's point of view, beyond duality. Meanwhile, we live in a world where good and evil must be clearly discriminated unless you don't care about the world you live in. Somebody, right this minute, tonight, as we sit here, is walking around knowing that they said, fire! and that surface-to-air missile went up, right? And whether it was a mistake or not, 300 bodies fell out of the sky. Some still strapped into their seats. And the story goes, they're still out there in the field tonight. But somebody knows they did it. Maybe they went, oops, after they looked to see what came down, but they did it. And nobody has stepped forward, duh, to acknowledge. Good and evil? Is it good to leash lethal explosives at objects in the sky? I don't know. There's evil, good and evil. So discriminate, tell the difference clearly and choose. Then you don't have to walk around knowing that your actions put an end to 300 lives and all the families impacted by that. And Malaysia Airlines may cease to exist. If they can, who can absorb this? So, good and evil exist, all right? So that's, that's one. 
uh, Jerry's question was about composting. And so if you decide certain amount of resources, weeds will grow and suck up the, the, the resources, the, the nutrition that could go to flowers that I want, to crops that I want. So I'm going to pull up this vegetable matter and put it on a compost heap. Compost, I grew up with compost heaps. My parents were gardeners. And behind the garage, we, had a, we dug a pit. I dug the pit. And every time I mowed the lawn, which was once a week, I would take the lawn clippings and dump them in the compost heap. And every time I raked the leaves, which growing up in Toledo, Ohio, we have lots and lots and lots and lots of elms and maples and, and all kinds of trees, I would take the leaves and I would put them in the compost heap. And I would throw in a handful of lime and water it and wait. And if you do that and you periodically go out with a, with a spading fork, not a pitchfork, pitchforks work, but a spading fork, turn it over, you aerate it, and you wait. Within three weeks, a change will happen, particularly with the grass cuttings. And in a, in a chilly morning, you'll go out with your spading fork, turn it over, and the steam will come rising out of your compost heap. And it's hot in there, and you look and there's this white spidery powder on the decaying vegetation. It's called a compost heap. So the, the components are vegetable matter, water, just enough to make it slightly damp, and air. You aerate it. And over time, if you do it well, it's pretty simple, it will change. And the, all the stuff you need is there. Lime is, will quicken it, right? But what happens is um, the matter breaks down and it becomes really nutrient-rich fertilizer. Now, if you want to toss your organic um, apples, peels, coffee grounds, anything that's not animal matter, anything that's not bones and grease, you can put your organic garbage on your compost pile. People do that too. Sometimes eggshells, if you eat eggs. Sometimes uh, no citrus, doesn't like citrus. No orange peels. Banana peels, good. So take the citrus out, take the animal products out if they're in your kitchen, and throw the garbage on there. You can do newspaper strips too. Shred it because wood, wood matter. And the compost pile will very happily Break it all down. Now here in Berkeley, we have these black plastic compost bins, really sexy kind of high-tech compost bins with various drawers and stuff. And sure, you can do it that way. But you, all you need is a pit. Just dig out the soil a little bit and you have a compost heap. Um, doesn't smell if you do it right. The smell only comes if you don't turn it. And if you have only garbage, it's a garbage pit. That's not a compost heap. You need lawn cuttings or leaves. You put it in and magically this fertilizer comes out. Okay, that's the analogy. In the mind, what's the pit? The pit is the mind. The vegetable matter are your wang xiang, your false thoughts. The discursive stuff, the greed, the anger, the delusion, the pride, the doubt, the low self-esteem. You take those thoughts, not acting on them, you prune them, you cut, clip them, and you let them go. You don't react. They will become the fertilizer for the real fruits and flowers of the mind. Kindness, compassion, serenity, right? Joy, patience, generosity, which are the things that grow from that very same ground of the mind. The other really good analogy of it is diamonds come from coal. Every diamond is a compressed lump of coal. Where does the coal come from? The coal is compressed vegetable matter, hydrocarbons, right? That over time, ferns, some paleolithic vegetation fell down, got compressed, and heat and 
power, you know, this great pressure over the millennia, turned it into coal. And then the coal, with the same process of heat and compression, turns it into diamonds. Originally it's a plant, now it's a diamond. The plant is relatively common, the diamond is really rare. So false thoughts are relatively common, Bodhi thoughts, this thought, this thought to wake up is especially rare. So that's what we mean. Got it? And time is up. We've done two stanzas. But here we are up in the heavens with the devas flying around making their offerings. And what we get next is the rest of the song. These are songs. The Dharma nature. The next verse of the song tells us what the Dharma nature is like. It's quiet. has no hallmarks. It's like space. It doesn't discriminate. You don't grasp. You don't attach. The path of words. True and real. Forever pure. That's coming up next week. Um, about that illness of affliction, Master Hua would say, I'm just like you. I'm no different than you at all, except for one thing. I don't have any afflictions. He would say, He said, And I have a cramp, which is an afflicted state. Ah. That's my Porsche putting out black smoke out the smokestack. So, how about that? And that simple phrase, I don't have any afflictions. It's like, oh yeah, Shervo? Well, that's cool. You mean no greed at all? You mean no anger? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's really different. On your Dharma request sheet, if you flip it over, there's the dedication of merit. And if you have the songbook in front of you, one of these guys, it's also in the back of the songbook. This is another double chorus instrument, like the mandolin. Instead of six strings, it's got 12. Two in octaves, in unison that is, and then four pairs in octaves. So the opportunities for this harp-like, uh, harpsichord-like quality are, are big. So um, this week was a difficult week in terms of suffering in the world and tension and pain. So we have plenty to transfer merit to with the wish to end, reduce that suffering. Um, I don't know yet anybody who was on that airplane, but I have uh, some Dutch friends who I expect I'll be getting the word pretty quickly about. Who, who knew who? The suffering in Gaza is beyond imagination. So, plenty of opportunity to transfer merit. So let's do it with a wish. It's your wish, whatever you would like to, where you'd like to send your goodness. as one and radiant with light. Share the fruits of peace with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. 
If people hear and see How hands and hearts can find in giving unity May their minds awake To great compassion, wisdom, and to joy May kindness find reward May all who sorrow leave their grief and pain. May this boundless light break the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate and wise. All right. Um, we sang a song up on yeah, Buddha Root Farm uh, last week, last week, um, when folks went out to the waterfall, we stayed behind and sang a song. Called Our Hero. And this song is comes from the Lotus Sutra. It's a story found in the Dharma flower, the Lotus Sutra, about a bodhisattva whose name is Never Disparage, Chang Ching Pusa. And this bodhisattva's thing is, he bows to everybody he meets and says, I dare not slight you because you're going to be a Buddha someday. That's his practice. He bows to everybody he sees and says, you're going to be a Buddha. He gives him a prediction of Buddhahood. And uh, in the sutra describes what people do when they get this prediction. A lot of people are very unhappy. How dare you say that about me? You know? And even some of the monks and nuns uh, are unhappy about it. So two guys from Tassajara, Greg Fain and Ben Gustin, wrote this incredible ballad about the Bodhisattva never disparage, and it has the whole Lotus Sutra chapter in there. And the chorus goes, I would never disparage you or keep you at arm's length. Where you only see your weaknesses, I only see your strengths. I would never despise you or put you down in any way. Cause it's clear to me, I can plainly see You'll be a Buddha someday, Amitabha. Now the original says, I love you, but I have trouble with that line. It's good from the radical staple, you know. So we can say Amitabha. There we go. Yep. Okay. So, I would never disparage you or keep you at arm's length. Where you only see your weaknesses, I only see your strengths. I would never despise you or put you down in any way. Because it's clear to me, I can plainly see you'll be a Buddha someday. All right, feel free to join in. Here we go. There's a book called the Lotus Sutra that you really ought to know about. A holy book that has the power to remove all fear and doubt. The book tells a story about a man who means the world to me. Who could just as well have been a woman Except for male hegemony They called him the Bodhisattva never disparage the Bodhisattva never despise I make it my ambition To see the world through his pure eyes I will never disparage you Or keep you at arm's length You only see your weaknesses I only see your strengths I would never despise you or put you down in any way 
Cause it's clear to me I can plainly see You'll be a Buddha someday Amitabha Now, you don't have to use the phony country and western accent. You're free to sing it any way you want. Now the Bodhisattva never disparaging from countless kalpas in the past. In the time of the counterfeit dharma was something of an outcast. Cause the monks and nuns of his time were known for their arrogance and vanity. And these were the very folks who exercised power and authority. But my boy never concerned himself if they treated him like a freak. Cause he bowed to everybody equally and these were the words he speak. Here we go. I will never disparage you or keep you at arm's length. Where you only see your weaknesses, I only see your strengths. I would never despise you or put you down in any way. It's clear to me, I can plainly see, you'll be a Buddha someday. You can join the last word, Amitabha. There we go. He never read or recited the scriptures much. He only liked to practice respect. But the monks and nuns of his time didn't meet it like you might expect. Instead, they cursed him and they reviled him. They wished that he would go. Cause they all had self-esteem issues like most everyone else I know. And they beat him and they pelted him with stones, tried to drive him away. He'd just run off a safe distance and turn around and say, join me. I will never disparage you or keep you at arm's length. Where you only see your weaknesses, I only see your strength. I would never despise you or put you down in any way. Cause it's clear to me, I can plainly see you'll be a Buddha someday. Amitabha. All right. And so it went on for years and years. He was the target of scorn and abuse. But still our hero never shed no tears or wondered what's the use. Till he came to the end of his natural lifespan, lay down and fixing to die. And he heard the Holy Lotus Sutra being preached up in the sky. And his life was extended for millions of years, living to this day. In the pages of the Lotus Sutra, you can still hear him say, I would never disparage you or keep you at arm's length. You only see your weaknesses, I only see your strengths. I would never despise you or put you down in any way. Cause it's clear to me, I can plainly see you'll be a Buddha someday. Amitabha. I would never disparage you or keep you at arm's length. You only see your weaknesses, I only see your strength. I would never despise you or put you down in any way. Cause it's clear to me, I can plainly see you'll be a Buddha someday. Amitabha. That's our hero. Isn't that a good song? Okay, now I wanted to share with everybody. By the way, last week, our friend Sam Halsey and his friend Lynn came at the end of the lecture. Lynn took off her shoes, put them on the shoe rack, and when she came back out, those shoes were gone. So if anybody, by mistake, took a pair of shoes home, thought they might have been yours, it was dark out there, and you discover when you got home, by golly, these are mighty nice shoes. Uh, no, you said, these are wrong. These are not my shoes. Please bring them back. Let us know. We'll be happy to return them to uh, Lynn and to Sam. So, uh, thought, thought for, what do you say, word to the wise. What I have to share with you tonight is something extraordinary that just came uh, recently to my attention and we're uh
Tom Mahon. People know Tom Mahon uh, from the late 1990s here at the monastery. Tom is a journalist uh, for uh, Silicon Valley corporations and uh, has been, he wrote the first novel set in Silicon Valley called Charged Bodies. He wrote the history of Hewlett Packard and how it began with a bomb site and so and so on and so and, and on and on. Tom and I, uh, back in 96, 97, 98, up to 2000, 2003, um, regularly took part in high-tech conferences to offer human values in the high-tech world, a seminar. And we went to the Balambrosa Center down in Menlo Park and for three or four weekends uh, opened up this uh, space where engineers and people who um, had uh, been steamrolled by their startups uh, or by their time to market uh, could come and talk about the, the reality of trying to keep your heart together while living in the fast lane on Highway 101 and Highway 280. And we finally wound up with a website called reconnecting.com, C-A-L-M. Uh, reconnecting.com.com. So uh, anyway, t uh, now there is a whole new need for, s for similar events. Um, so we're considering reviving this place where people who are addicted to virtual reality can come and talk about it. Uh, people who are nervous about how quickly we've gone from flesh and blood to, to virtual relationships, uh, etc. So this is just, the idea is just beginning again. We had our first meeting last week. We're going to talk about it. And um, Tom came up with a video that I wanted to share with everybody that is that tells our story in pictures in a way that uh, many, many words cannot be as eloquent. So we're going to get hooked up here, if you give us a second. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end our webcast at this point. So our friends who are joining us online, we will see you same time, same place next week. Only, I will be in North Carolina. We're going to, uh, I'll tell you about that in just a bit. Okay, it took, it's going to, there we go, it's firing up. Uh, we don't need the audio. It's really, really loud. And there's only, uh, this has subtitles. So... <laughs> 